morning. If you're new here with us, welcome to Park Cities Baptist. We're super pumped you're here with us. We want to be a, a strong church uh, for you. Uh, and, and I feel like that's pretty normal. People want to be a, a strong group of people. People want to be strong individuals, right? I don't want to be weak. I want to be strong. And we like to find different ways to test our strength, right? Like you might go to the gym and, and, and lift some weights, max out, right? You might try to uh, run a race to test your strength, right? When I was in the Army, we had a test of strength. It was called the Army Physical Fitness Test, the APFT. This was a grueling test of push-ups, sit-ups, and a two-mile run. It wasn't that grueling. But for whatever reason, I thought it was really hard. And I think the part that I found the hardest is that I had a weakness in my strength. I was pretty good on the run. I was okay with my sit-ups, which is surprising. The push-ups were the part that got me. I have long arms. I mean, they're not like gangly weird, but they're, they're longer. And there were some people who were like short and just like really like, and they could just pound them out. And I was like, why, Lord, why? Why am I not built like this? Of course, they would struggle on the run because they were shorter and they, I had longer legs. So I would ridicule them as I lapped them. No, I'm just kidding. I wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't do that. But we all want to be strong. And there will be things that you encounter in your life that will encourage you, that you'll find your strength is well adapted for. Much like the two-mile run was, was good for the way I was built and I enjoyed running, in the same way, push-ups were hard for me. So you might run into things in your life that are hard, that you find that the things that you're good at, the things you like doing, maybe even the things that you, were, grew, you grew up believing don't seem well adapted to the challenges that you're facing and you find out that you've got a weakness and it's being exposed. Maybe this is where you're at right now. Maybe you're in a season of high vulnerability right now. Or maybe this is a great time for you right now. Maybe things are going really well and, and the, the, the challenges you face are well matched to your strength. But regardless, we tend to match the challenges that we face with strength that we find in ourselves. That's usually what we do. But scripture calls us to a different kind of strength. We're in a series called All Things New, and we're going to talk about having a new strength today by looking at Philippians 4, 10 through 13. And what I want to do, because this is the way the text kind of goes, is I want us to look at two places that we can find strength, and then in the middle, look at one place that we tend to find strength, but we shouldn't, okay? So the first one is we need to have strength in community. Look at verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you've revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. So Paul, again, we, we, we've talked about this a lot. Paul's buddies in Philippi have sent him with a letter through Epaphroditus, a gift of some kind, some kind of monetary gift, which is probably designed to feed him while he's in a Roman prison. Because in Roman prisons, it was up to uh, your friends and your families to make sure that you were well fed. If you didn't have friends and family, then you just kind of starved, right? So Paul's saying awkwardly, thank you for the gift, but I don't want you to think, again, he's very awkward here, I don't want you to think that the only reason why I'm thanking you is because I can get something out of my relationship with you. I don't want you to think that I'm using you. And again, going on, he even says, not that I have needs, but I do have needs. Again, it's very awkward, like very strange. Maybe the worst gift exchange of all time. And so Paul is, why is he, go, why is he being like this? Why is he making it so difficult? It's because of the Greek culture, Roman culture at the time, which many friendships were based on reciprocity, on reciprocating. If I can get something from you and you can get something from me, that is a valid friendship. That's a good friendship. We're both getting something out of it. If a friendship is one-sided, it's not really a friendship. That's what they believed. That's what they thought. Aristotle, at the same length, went on to say that it was, it was even a, a greater friendship would be a friendship with somebody who was completely self-sufficient. Why? Why? Because how can you know if you can really trust somebody, if you really like you, if they really want to be friends with you, unless they don't need anything from you? If somebody doesn't need anything from you, then that's got to be your best friend, right? Because they like you for who you are. Self-sufficiency was something that was taught and preached in the Greek and Roman culture. And Paul is doing the best he can to make it clear that, no, 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 no. I love you guys. 
Whether you sent me something or not, I love you. I'm so thankful for you. The word he says here, it says, you've renewed your concern for me. This word renewed means to blossom. They've allowed their, their love for him to blossom again, which kind of implies that maybe they were giving for a while, stopped, and now they're giving again. And Paul's like, thank you. This is, I, I love you. The, the gift is the vehicle through which you've shown your love. The gift is merely a means of communication. But many of us have fallen in love with the narrative of self-reliance and self-sufficiency. We think that that is the way a human being is supposed to be. Self-sufficient, independent, self-reliant. And it's not necessarily like modern day human being, modern day Westerners fault. It is hardwired into our cultural DNA. Because remember Aristotle, Aristotle's like the founder of Western thought. He's not in charge of everything, but most of like what we think kind of germinates with, with, with Aristotle. He kind of gets the party started him and Plato, and it, he says this, he says, happiness belongs to the self-sufficient. Another Greek philosopher, Epicurus, says the most important consequence of self-sufficiency is freedom, and if we're honest, like that resonates with us. We do feel happy when we're able to take care of ourselves. We like the independence. And then if you fast forward to the United States, fast forward to being Americans, we love being strong, independent people, Right? I mean, one of our core documents, I mean, maybe our core document, is literally called the Declaration of what? Independence. One of our greatest philosophers, Ralph Waldo Emerson, wrote an essay called Self-Reliance. It's about being an individual and rejecting community. One of our worst philosophers, Kim Kardashian, <laughs> said, if you put the effort in, you can get what you want. Thanks, Kim. Great contribution to philosophy. We have full on bought the lie that the apex of human existence is self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and independence. We think that's, what it, that's the most important thing, but here's the problem with that. And what happens is, when you can't be self-sufficient, because there will be a time when your independence, when your self-reliance fails, and you have to have somebody else. You need somebody else. Maybe it's when you get older and you can't take care of yourself. When that illusion breaks, you'll realize it's for the lie that what it was. And you'll start to feel weak and you're like, God, what's wrong with me? Why am I not able to be the self-reliant, strong individual like everybody else is? Here's the thing, nobody else is because you weren't designed to be that way. Go back to Genesis 1. God creates human beings and you know what the first thing he tells them? He says, go get separate houses and don't talk to each other because you need to be self-reliant. No, no. He says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Because you want people. We need each other. In Genesis 2, there's a recapitulation of the creation story. And God creates man. And he says, you know what? It's not good that man's alone. It's not good for man to be alone. You fast forward to Acts 2.44 when the church, the New Testament church starts up. And guess what? They're always together. They're like always together. Like it's really weird always together, sharing everything together. First Peter 5, 8, Peter says, Satan prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to, dev to devour. Fun nature fact. Lions eat animals that are by themselves. That's how they hunt. If they see a zebra or a gazelle by itself, lions aren't like, wow, check out that strong independent zebra over there. Man, we need to be like that. Lions are like, nah, that's fast food. <laughs> Hopefully not too fast, because we want to eat it. Even lions hunt in a group. Think about that. When you're driving down the road and you see a, 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 a cow or a sheep or something, and again, we don't sit there and think to ourselves, man, I want to be like that sheep out there who's just so muscly up in his wool, being like tough guy all by himself. No, no. I've seen enough planet Earth to know that that sheep's gonna get eaten. The Bible does not describe you as a lion or a lioness, ladies. You are sheep or you are goats, both of which are herd animals. We are not designed to be by ourselves. And this is one of the things I found immensely frustrating about physical training with the army. We would wake up 
early in the morning, like 5, 5, 8, 5 30. And we'd put on our little workout uniforms and we'd go and we'd gather and we'd assemble and we'd start working out together. And I thought in my small mind that we, would, we were working out so that we could pass the physical fitness test so we'd get good scores. So we'd run together and all stuff. Then one day, this drill sergeant had the audacity to shatter this illusion that I was under. He said that if all you're doing to work out to pass your army physical fitness test is what we do in the mornings in physical training, you're not going to do well. And I was like, then what are we doing here? Why are we doing this? This makes no sense. This isn't going to help me pass my test. I don't want to be here because I don't like working out. Turns out the point of the physical training as a group had nothing to do with getting us ready to pass a test. It was all about building a team, building community, and I was trying to be self-reliant. I was trying to take care of myself. I didn't care what the group did. I didn't care how the group scored. I wanted to pass the test. I wanted to do well. It was about me because I was self-sufficient, I was self-reliant, and I felt like I could do better on my own. Do you know why self-sufficiency feels good? Why it's an illusion? Let's be honest, it's easier. It's easier to be self-sufficient. It's easier to be independent. You don't have all these people bothering you with their needs. How dare they? Here's the problem. When it's working, it feels good. When things are going well and you're self-sufficient, it feels nice but that's about as far as your strength goes. You see, when you're by yourself and things are going well, you are leveraging what strength you have to make sure that everything still goes well, right? It's all realized strength. And yeah, you can add to your strength, you can become a stronger person, but ultimately you're only adding to your strength. But when you're in strong in community, strong in a group, it's all potential strength. Because I've got all these people waiting around ready to celebrate with me when something goes well, to help me in a crisis when things go poorly. That's potential strength. And that's strength that multiplies each person contributing their strength to the group. Travis alone is as strong as Travis gets. Travis in community is infinitely stronger. And so you need a community. You need a community. And this one right here, if you're new, if you're relatively new, if you're looking for a church, or maybe you're just kind of sitting on the fence, this is as good a community as any. Now, I know that's not a great selling point. I'm not in sales. But it's the truth. You are not going to find some mystical, magical church that's just perfect. And if you do, guess what? When you show up, it won't be perfect anymore because we're not perfect, we're not perfect people. This church here, I've been here for a long time, 12, 13 years, something like that, 11 years. We do some things really well. We do some things not so well, because we're not perfect, and we try to work on those things. But some of the things that we do really well, we love Jesus, we love the gospel, and we try to do a really good job of loving other people. And we try to hit those marks. And I think that's a great place to be. And I think it would be a great place for you to be. This is where I found my home in Texas. Before I was ever married, before I ever had kids, I don't have any family here besides this. And it was a blessing for me when I moved. Let it be a blessing to you too. Here's my challenge to you. Get in a group. I want you to get in a group. If you're not a part of a group, get in a group on Sunday morning, a group midweek, and commit to this. I'm gonna do it by Thanksgiving. Because by the time the holidays get here, meh. It's really difficult to stick with anything, but do it by Thanksgiving. Be like, I am gonna be in an established group. That gives you a few weeks to try some different places out. If you got questions about a group to be in, let me know, but get in a group because you are stronger in community. So we talked about strength in community. Let's talk about a place where we try to find strength, but it's not really a great place. Strength despite our circumstances. Verse 11, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I'm to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger and abundance and need. Paul has his joy in the Lord. This book is very joyful. But let's be real, Paul has a hard life. 
2 Corinthians 11 has this like really famous laundry list of struggles that Paul's been through. He's been shipwrecked numerous times. He's been beaten. He's been whipped. He's been stoned. He's been left for dead. So all this stuff go on in his life. He's had a difficult life, all for the sake of the gospel. At the same time, as he says here in the passage, he's abounded. He's had opportunities where he's had what he needs. So there have been times in his life where he's been well-fed. He's been well-lodged. Things have gone well for him. And regardless of those situations, you have to be pretty zen in your life to not have anything affect you ever. Doesn't matter what happens, pretty even keel, nothing bothers me. And I don't think that's what Paul's talking about here. Paul's not talking about being zen. One, there was a philosophy of his day called stoicism. And it was basically all about not letting anything affect you. That was like the climax of happiness. Paul's not a stoic. He's not talking about that. In fact, what he says in that same passage, 2 Corinthians 11, he says, I have anxiety for all the churches. Basically, all the churches he planted, he's worried about all the time. Are they gonna be okay? Are they being taught false teaching? What's going on? That's not Zen. That's not stoicism. Jesus himself, the night he's, he's being betrayed, like Judas is on his way with the army to capture him. And Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane sweating drops of blood. Again, I am not like a Zen master, but I'm pretty sure sweating drops of blood is not even keel. It seems pretty worked up to me. John chapter 11, Jesus' friend dies. And Jesus is like 30 minutes from resurrecting him. It's not long. And he weeps. He like breaks down, ugly crying, because his friend died. It's not stoicism. The reality is things will happen in your life and they will affect you, which is why you cannot find strength in your circumstances. It's not a good source of strength. It's not a good metric for strength. Circumstances will deceive you. And our tendency is when things happen to us that it's only bad things that can disrupt our strength. Because uh, you get a bad diagnosis, you lose your job, you, you have a tragedy happen, and that very easily can send you into a tailspin of doubt, fear, worry, Bitterness towards the Lord, absolutely. Anger towards other people. But Paul's also talking about being content in good circumstances too. And it is good things. Good things can make us just as susceptible and dangerous spiritually. Getting a new job, getting a promotion, your sports team winning, getting married, kids, grandkids, retiring, leaving a job you don't really like. All of these things can give you the illusion of contentment and joy. But it's just circumstantial. Because at the end of the day, they are just as taxing to your strength as the difficult things are. And why is this? Well, one, feeling good when things are good around you, like I said, gives you an illusion of strength. The times when I drift spiritually aren't when things are hard. Because I've been a believer, I guess, long enough that when things are hard, I know at least enough to go to the Lord. My anxieties and my fears turn me towards Christ. It's when things are going well that I'm really exposed, when I'm really vulnerable, because I'm like, Lord, I got this. You go help someone else, because you're not omnipotent, I guess, and right? Why do I say that? Go help someone else, right? But that's the attitude we have. It's like, I got this. I got this under control. I don't need you right now. We have this sense that we can handle everything on our own when things are good. And here's why. Because things are working for us. When things are working, it seems like it seems like we've got everything under control. And this is idolatry. Comfort, success, approval, gain. When you're accomplishing those things, it feels good. And so you feel like your strength is strong enough. But this sets you up for a second way to fail. It creates a problem. You start doing things to keep the good times going. Another thing is a unique human sort of trait. Like when your sports team wins, when a sports team wins, people go and like get absolutely hammered to celebrate that their team won. Now, if your team loses, again, I'm not condoning it, not condoning it, but I, I, if your team loses, I understand like killing the pain. I get that. Cognitively makes sense to me. But like, hey, we won, yay. Let's forget everything that happened over the last 24 hours makes no sense. You know why we do that? 
I mean, we don't because we're Baptists, but other people do that. <laughs> we do that because we want to keep the good times going. We want to keep the good times going. We want to feel that feeling again. And it's not just with sports. You get that first promotion, or that first raise, and you're like, ooh, that felt good. Let's do it again. You get that first degree, and you're like, oh, that felt good. Let's do it again. Or some of us are like, no, never. <laughs> you get that first raise. You buy that first house. You get that new car. You're like, oh, that felt good. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. And then it shows up in sinister ways. Man, when me and my wife were, were meeting each other for the first time, it was so nice, butterflies and rainbows and roses. And I haven't felt that about anybody in about five years, but that person over there is giving me the kind of attention I want. I want to feel that way again. Let's keep that good time going. We start doing things. We, if we fall in love with the way our circumstances feel, you will sacrifice your values, you'll sacrifice your morals, and above all else, you'll begin to sacrifice your faith in Christ. And at first it'll hurt, but after a while we'll be deadened to it because we're gonna be chasing that good feeling. You know who does that? You know what kind of people do that? Addicts. People that are addicted to drugs are addicted because they're constantly chasing that high, that buzz that they got. A lot of us aren't addicted to drugs, we're addicted, addicted to success. We're addicted to approval. You know what I'm addicted to? Things going smoothly. As long as everything's going well, like the way I measure whether or not the day's been good is if everything went according to plan. That's my drug. We've got to find strength regardless of circumstances because your circumstances lie to you. You cannot measure your strength by circumstances. It's not a good idea. It's not a good metric. In the same way that doing push-ups, sit-ups, and a two-mile run was not the way to test whether or not you were physically fit, and actually the army no longer does this anymore. Trust me, there were some people that were not physically fit that passed that test. I was one of them. <laughs> so where do we find our strength? Nehemiah 8, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 5. You don't have to go there. There's this great part. So the, the Israelites were exiled because of disobedience. They're brought back to the land and they rebuild the temple with, in, in the book of Ezra. In the book of Nehemiah, they rebuild the wall around the city and they're having like a big commemoration service, like a big gathering and they read the whole law. So like Leviticus, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all these books of the Bible. So you think today's going long, man, oh man, should have been there for that one. And the, they get to the end of it and the people are weeping. They are devastated because they see how far they've fallen. They see how far they've missed the mark of worshiping the Lord. And Nehemiah gets up in front of them. And rather than saying, you know what? Yeah, you should feel bad. You know what he says? He says, stop. Yes, we failed. And yes, we fell far. But you have confessed. You have repented. And now you find your joy in the Lord. Here's why. And this is what he says in verse five. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. If you're in a cycle of shame and guilt, you're not gonna be strong. You know why? Because the joy of the Lord will not be your strength. If you think the Lord doesn't want anything to do with you, then you won't have joy in him. If you're afraid of him, you won't have joy in him. And you won't be strong. The joy of the Lord is our strength. So how do we get this? How do we acquire this strength of the Lord, this joy of the Lord? Let's talk about strength in Christ. Let's read verse 12. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And then he says this, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul says that he's learned a secret. This might be a nod to the mystery religions of the day. So there was these little cults that popped up that were around sort of like uh, sort of pop deities like Isis, uh, the Egyptian goddess. And so people would go and worship these like cultic deities and there would be like initiation rituals and secret things that only if you were involved in the group would you know about. It was a lot like being in a fraternity or sorority, right? So it was like Delta Tau Isis uh, was the group you could be a part of. And so they would go and they would, they would do these things. So Paul says, I know the secret. I've learned something that you don't know. 
and I'm gonna share it with you. And he says this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And you're like, well, Travis, that's not much of a secret. I saw that on my favorite football player the other day. Tell you what, I think it actually is a secret because I'm pretty sure Philippians 4 verse 13 has nothing to do with scoring touchdowns. What has Paul learned? What's the secret that he learned? It's not about finding a parking space. What does he say? What's the last time that he used the word learned before this? Before he says learned the secret, in verse 11, he says, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am in to be what? Content. And then he says, I've learned the secret of what? Being content. And I can be content. I can do that. And in all situations, I can do that through Christ who strengthens me. So whether everything's going good, I've learned to be content. Whether everything's going bad, I've learned to be content. The power uh, through Christ who strengthens me. This is not self-sufficiency. We have this tendency to really focus on this verse and to focus on the first part. I can do all things. And that's usually where we stop. Now we tack on the through Christ who strengthens me because we, we just want to but I legitimately think most of us believe it's I can do all things. So let's talk about what the secret is. And the way I wanna do this is I listened to a great sermon, uh, I think this week, yeah, uh, by a guy named Hudson Taylor. It's on the Revived Thoughts podcast. I've mentioned this before. Uh, Basically they take transcripts of old sermons, like really old sermons, and they record them. And uh, people read them and record them. It's really cool. And so Hudson Taylor was a missionary to China uh, in the late 1800s. And this is from a sermon that he preached in 1900 in Carnegie Hall. Uh, And so uh, this is towards the end of his life. And basically there's churches and Christians in China because of Hudson Taylor. That's how much of a stud this guy was. And he's talking about the power of God, the source of power. And how do we have access to this power? And he says a few things. I've got three of them right here. The first thing he says is, it's an available power. Many of us think that we do not have access to the power of God because we're not holy enough. We're not righteous enough. It's like Thor's hammer. We're not worthy, so we can't pick it up. In the same way, we think, oh, I've gotta be super spiritual. The power of God is for like people like that work at the church or Mother Teresa or somebody like that. No, 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 no. The power of God is available for everybody. Why? Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Nehemiah says this to a whole group of people. The joy of the Lord is our strength. So that means the joy of the Lord is available to everyone. How do you get it? How do you acquire it? You put your faith in Christ. You find your joy in him rather than in your circumstances, rather in your things. It's only accessed by confession and repentance. The thing about uh, our culture is we think we have to always be moving forward, right? That's how you get stronger. You, you lift weights, you, you, you bench press more than you did before, you run farther than you did before, you work harder than you've ever worked before. Christianity is the only way you get stronger is by actually like going backwards. That's why many of us don't like confession and repentance. Because it's like, ah, I've got to go back through things again. Yeah, you do. Going back through the things we messed up on, going back through the mistakes we've made. Anybody ever worked out with a personal trainer? I never have, so I can only assume what it's like. But one of the great things about having a personal trainer, I have heard, is that there's somebody there to tell you when you're doing it wrong. And you correct your form and you wind up getting stronger. So you have to go back, you have to relearn how to do some things in order to do it better to do it right. Confession and repentance is that. It's the Lord coming to us and being like, hey, I know you thought that you weren't prideful here, but guess what, you actually are. And you're like, oh man, I didn't see that. Thank you, Lord, forgive me for being prideful. Of course I forgive you, my son died for you. Now come on, give me a big hug and let's go forward and let's have joy in the Lord and strength. That's how it's done. You see, Paul here is facing death, possibly. He's not going to die uh, at this point but he is facing it because he's in prison, he could die. What makes somebody say, I'm content in all circumstances that's going to possibly die? Somebody that death's not a fear for him. He's not worried about it anymore. Stop trying to be in, your, in control of your own strength. Stop trying to be strong in and of yourself. Stop trying to be self-sufficient. Let go of that. Recognize that to be strong as a follower of Christ, you have to let go of the things that that are self-sufficient, that are independent. You gotta let go of it. Because Jesus, 
let go of his self-sufficiency in order to die for us. He let go of his power. He let go of his strength. His weakest moment was his greatest strength. When he bled and he died for us, and you put your faith and you trust in him rather than in yourself. That's the difference. It's a power achieved by waiting. Taylor talks about how obsessed we are with metrics. Uh, and again, this is back in 1900, so like, we're not really obsessed with measuring things anymore uh, and making sure things are successful now. We've, we've moved past that as a culture. I'm being very sarcastic right now. We're obsessed with measuring things and making sure we know how we're getting stronger. I had this thing happen to me this week where I got a text. It wasn't even bad news. It was like unsettling news. I don't even go that far. Unwelcome news, maybe is the way I'd put it. And I don't know what happened to me. I think maybe I was just stressed out this week. I started panicking. And it wasn't about like my modern day context. I was going 10, 20, 30 years in the future and being like, this is the course that we're on. Like, we've messed up. I've messed up. This is not going to go well. It was very unsettling. And so in those moments when that happens to us, and it's surprising what kind of things knock us off course like that, we've got to turn to the Lord. You've got to take to him your fears, your concerns, your worries, and then you've got to wait on him to respond. A lot of us bring our stuff to him and then we just move right on. Just let me know, Lord, when you're going to respond to me. You've got to be actively waiting in the Lord. You know what the worst exercise in the world is? Anything you have to hold for like a minute. Planking, it's awful. Why? Because like you have to just sit there. If you want to stop time, plank. It will not move. If I were to tell everybody right now, get down on the floor, we're going to plank. Some of you would be like, mm, absolutely not, not going to do it. Some of you would start and be like, hey, I'm going, doing great. And then others of you would be like, yeah, I'm doing fantastic. You know what the difference is between the people who would be like, yeah, I didn't really make it. And the other people would be like, yeah, I've done it a lot. The people who have practiced it. We need to practice waiting on the Lord when things are good. Don't practice waiting on the, Lord's when you get the, bad, on the Lord when you've got the bad diagnosis, when you're in the midst of trauma, when you're in the midst of tragedy, when you don't know what's gonna happen. When you need to hear from the Lord right away, don't let that be the first time you've waited on the Lord. You'll be frustrated. But if you wait on the Lord when things are good, then you build up that strength and you find joy in waiting on him because you know he's gonna come through for you. You know it. Lastly, it's a power achieved by emptying yourself. Taylor says this, there's another power, a power far too little appreciated and sought after, the power of self-emptying and unresisting suffering. I don't know why we think every other religion that's ever been founded, you are supposed to be like the person who founded it. Like that's the idea. You, you listen to their teachings and you go and live like them. For whatever reason, for us, we look at Jesus sacrificing himself and we're like, yeah, good job, Jesus, thank you, but we don't actually have to sacrifice. We are called to be like Christ in emptying ourselves. And Philippians 2 says it. He emptied himself. Jesus calls us to empty ourselves as well. And here's, here's the, the, the truth of what's gonna happen in your life. You will lose something. Maybe you're in a season right now where you're losing something. But there will come a time, there will come a season where you will lose something. Something will be taken from you. Whether it's your health, whether it's your mind, whether it's your physical ability to take care of yourself, Heaven forbid, when maybe it's one of your children, maybe it's a parent, somebody you counted on your whole life, maybe it's that career, and maybe it's not you got fired, but it's just you've aged out, you can't do it anymore. And I'll tell you what, that will be very hard in any circumstance, but you know how you'll access the, the Lord and the strength that he has for you is by giving things away beforehand. If you are practiced in the giving away of things, when it comes time to, time to lose things, it won't feel so hard. You're like, oh, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. I have been generous with what I've had. I've given from my strength. I've given from my power and I will give again and again and again. And then when you wind up losing, yes, it'll be hard. I'm not sweeping that under the rug. But you'll know and you'll find joy somehow strangely, mysteriously in the hand of the Lord in that. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Finding your joy in Jesus Christ is the only way truly for you to be strong. And hopefully, as a community, we can help point one another to that strength and finding joy in that together. That's why it's so important for us to be together. We cannot find our strength in circumstances. It will let you down. 
and it will lie to you. Let's pray together. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the joy that we have. What God gives joy? Just freely pours it out on his people. Lord, I pray that if there's anybody in this room that just does not feel your joy, Lord, I pray that they would be overwhelmed by it. Lord, give us strength and give us joy, please, that we may glorify you and be what you've called us to be. In your son's great name we pray, amen.